Welcome everyone to the Plant Shift Initiative Speaker Series. Um, and it's uh, fitting that um, this inaugural lecture is on Earth Day. So happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, I want to uh, start by thanking Sebastiano, um, you'll hear from shortly, Castiglione, um, and Jane Patterson for their you know, inspiration and commitment to, uh, to bringing us together, to, to starting this conversation, um, you know, aimed at discussing how each of us can help fight climate change um, through plant-based food production. Um, I'm delighted this is happening at Northeastern. We are committed to addressing the climate change crisis in all its dimensions through our research, through our entrepreneurship, and through programs uh, like this one. Um, and we, we very much look forward to working with uh, uh, Sebastiano and Jane on, um, on finding you know, novel paths forward that we can you know, make a difference, um, in particular in terms of plant-based sustainable food practices. I um, also want to thank them, Jane and Sebastiano, for their generosity um, in establishing two co-op positions, which are, are now uh, available to students from any college who are entrepreneurs or scientists or, or leaders interested in addressing the climate crisis um, using plant-based solutions. Uh, the Sherman Center, for, for the students in the audience, the Sherman Center will be accepting uh, applications for these co-ops um, very soon. Um, the goal of this series, this uh, Plant Shift Initiative Speaker Series, um, is really just to encourage you know, exchange of ideas and to open up uh, channels of communication around plant-based solutions to, uh, to climate change. Uh, this is the first webinar uh, in the series, and we will have several more uh, lectures throughout the summer and the fall. Um, we have three speakers today. I want to thank them very much for, for coming to Northeastern, albeit virtually, but you're here. We're delighted you are here. And so Sebastiano Castiglione, um, Dale Vince, and Paul Watson, um, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for your passion and dedication you know, to this uh, um, topic. And, um, and, and thank you for coming to, coming, coming to be with us. Um, I think that's about it for me. Again, just thanks to Jane and Sebastiano. And um, I think I'm turning the program over directly to, uh, to Sebastiano. So over to you. Wonderful. <clears throat> and I hope you can hear me now. Can you? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, very happy to be here and to uh, launch this beautiful initiative, which was conceived by my wife, Jane Patterson, and then, um, you know, brought to into reality by the fantastic team at Northeastern University. And the idea is to encourage students, young people, to come up with ideas that directly uh, help fight uh, the climate crisis, which is as urgent as ever, every day more. And um, it, it's, it's a fantastic pleasure for me to be joined by my friend Dale Vance, who is the living demonstration of uh, two very important concepts for me. Uh, one is individuals can change the world, which is an important message for students and young people. Don't be discouraged, don't be pessimistic, don't think that there are limits. You can individually, as an individual, change the world. It's been done before and it's being done every day. And, and Dale is an incredible example. And, and Paul as well, who um, is not with us yet, but hopefully will come. Uh, but um, so, that's, that's one important concept. And the other one that I know that Dale, uh, Paul and myself share is that it is absolutely obvious that um, part of the path that leads to uh, successfully uh, curbing uh, the climate crisis is through the elimination of animals from all industries, especially food and agriculture, uh, where they represent a, an enormous uh, amount of, of damage linked to the emissions that their industry brings. Uh, but also because the uh, we were we were briefly discussing a few minutes ago uh, with Dale, um, everybody wonders how they can have an impact on the climate crisis. And the answer is very simple. Uh, instead of waiting for governments and, and international bodies and and divinities of all sorts to come to agreements that probably will never happen, uh, take steps individually. Again, as an individual, you can change the world. If you um, stop 
uh, eating animal-based foods, you are immediately reducing your uh, emissions to a level that becomes uh, not only acceptable, but actually brings uh, the end of the climate crisis. And it's something that you can do starting tonight, tomorrow morning, and, and it's the easiest thing to do. Um, but um, I want to start asking a couple of questions to Dale, who in my view represents the, uh, the embodiment of what an individual can do to change things. His history is well known. He, he's he's um, done phenomenal things in uh, uh, the, the electronic, uh, I mean, electric vehicles and, and substituting, uh, you know, the gas engine all over the place, creating uh, energy networks that are uh, based on renewable energy, curbing climate change and curbing emissions in every activity that, that he does. Uh, but he also created uh, and owns the first completely vegan soccer team, which I find fantastic. And, and, and it, it's amazing how everything comes together. And Dale, um, why don't you tell us how you, you see these things coming together in, in one cohesive plan? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, for me, the, um, <clears throat> I agree with you completely. You know, there's a lot of power in our hands. We, uh, we too easily think that we don't have agency in this climate crisis because it's such a big deal. We're bombarded with competing advice about what we should and shouldn't do, but it only really boils down to three things. It's about how we power our homes, it's about how we travel and what we eat. It's energy, transport and food. And 80% of everybody's personal carbon footprint is in those three things. We all spend money every day in those three things and we get to choose which way the world goes round actually. And we have choices. We can make different choices in all of those things. And as you say, one of the very easiest things to do is just stop eating animals. Um, I mean, to solve all of our crises, the climate crisis, the extinction of wildlife, the loss of habitat, the human health crisis, the multiple human health crises caused by pandemics and poor diet and bad air. We only need to do two things, stop burning fossil fuels and stop eating animals. I think it's really brutally simple. Fantastic. And it, it's interesting how, <clears throat> you know, burning fossil fuels requires, I mean, stopping burning for fossil fuels, uh, of course, is a personal choice, but also requires someone like you creating alternative networks, energy networks, which are very important. And, and I, uh, later on, I'm going to ask you about that. <clears throat> but the choice of what we eat and something we can do instantly and has massive impact, as we know, uh, by the numbers. And, and I wanted to ask you, Dale, I see, I see that I, I know that you're involved in, in different projects, also in the food space with uh, the Devil's Kitchen and Little Green Devils. Do you mind telling us about those? Yeah, happy to. So um, we've been running Forest Green for about 10 years now uh, as a vegan football club. It's, it's just one of many things we do, but it's the one that everybody wants to talk about because it's the most improbable thing that you can do. Uh, take a professional sports club, vegan, its fans, its players and everything like that. Um, and coming out the back of that, uh, somebody had the idea to make primary school dinners that were plant-based because it would be a good thing to do to get kids started on plant-based food early. So we started that a couple of years ago and um, that was super popular. It's gone into secondary schools and universities, into public spaces. Just before the lockdown, uh, we were going into other football clubs. Um, and, uh, and into retail, into online retail. And the, the food itself is um, really simple. It's free of the 14 major food allergens. So it's inclusive, everybody can eat it. There's no soy, wheat, nuts, uh, you, you name it, it's not in there, uh, which is uh, for me a really big deal. It's uh, based around protein, uh, sorry, pea protein, that's the protein source and um, vegetables. And my favorite is shiitake mushroom. Uh, and we make them here in Strad in a little factory that's powered by the wind and the sun. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing food and proving to be super popular. We we sent a box to a um, right wing radio DJ uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, his name's Mike Graham. We, we've become friends uh, debating climate issues and uh, he's going to try them this weekend and uh, tell his listeners about it. And, you know, this is part of what I think we need to do is, is to communi communicate outside of our bubbles. Uh, it's not on topic or it's not what you ask me, but uh, but that's where we're at at the moment, trying to break out of our kind of left-wing traditional environment, climate bubbles and, and talk to other people because we need a mass movement to make this change. 
Yeah, absolutely. And linking linking to that, you know, I'm I'm heavily involved in changing the food industry now. Being an investor in, <clears throat> I think it's almost seventy companies that that wow. uh, in the vegan food space. And um, one thing that is very important is we we need to provide good alternatives, tasty alternatives. No one's going to turn vegan eating tempeh. I'm sorry to say, well, whoever loves tempeh, but. I love to pay. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd say, you know, but but you but you can't, you know, you can't bring people from grilled meat to tempeh. They're not gonna do it. And there are so many interesting alternatives and good foods that that immediately substitute uh, animal food, including the, the one of the most exciting um, things that are happening now that are becoming reality, which is uh, cell-based. Uh, meat, which is actually animal without hurting any animals, and and might uh, you know trace a path to to substitution that is easy that is easier. But I want to take a moment to welcome Paul. Ciao, Paul. How are you? Oh, pretty good, thank you. Sorry, I just had a little bit of technical problems getting out. Here. It's okay. We we I don't know if we hear you a lot. It's it's uh, maybe your your mic is too low. Let me see. Is this better? Oh, that that's better. And. Um, so to 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 bring you up to speed on what we were saying, Paul, we were saying that uh, especially because we're talking to students and young people, um, we want to emphasize the power of individual choices and how every single one of us can change the world, as you demonstrate with your own life and history and everything you've done and you're doing, is taking the the fate of the oceans into your own hands. And I personally have lost track, but if, uh, if we were to count how many animals you've saved and how many uh, uh, environments of the oceans you have personally saved, we, we couldn't even calculate them all over the years. And, and, it's, and it's fantastic. And it, by the way, not, not by chance that both Dale and I are supporters of yours because what, what you do is, is phenomenal. But we were also thinking about um, how easy it is for individuals to change their habits. <clears throat> and because uh, Seaspiracy came out a few days ago, one of the most immediate things that one can do to save the oceans, and I'm going to ask you to elaborate on that, is stop eating seafood and fish today. And, and that is going to have a massive impact. Would you mind telling us more about that? Well, Sea Shepherd's ships uh, were vegetarian from 1979 until 1999, and then from 1999 until the present, they're all been all vegan. Now, what we say is you don't have to be vegan to join the crew, but you have to be vegan while you're on the crew. And the interesting thing about that is so many people who've been exposed to a vegan lifestyle while on the vessel, how they've actually adapted to it. A lot of people have concerns, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to survive on this. It's not good for my health. And uh, the, the general report when crew members leave is, whoa, I feel much better now. I, you know, all this has been very healthy. And, and a, good, a good number of them uh, continue to be vegan after leaving the ship. So we found that that's one of the best ways to get people involved is uh, not by preaching to them, but by, you know, allowing them to have that experience. Well, they don't really have any choice. They have to have that experience, but, uh, but, but, but it has been a very positive, uh, positive thing. And uh, I, I know it's, uh, it, it's been, it's difficult because a lot of people who call themselves vegetarians uh, eat fish. I don't know how they work that in logically, but they do. And um, so I, this is one of the great uh, things about this movie, Sea Spiracy is to, uh, is to really bring that to light. And also the fact that a good percentage of, uh, of uh, uh, the fish that's caught is actually uh, goes into the meat industry. It's fed to chickens, it's fed to pigs and to, to domestic salmon. In fact, as I say all the time, uh, we live in a world where chickens eat more fish than all the world's puffins and albatrosses put together. And uh, pigs are eating more fish than all the world's sharks. I mean, it's, a, it's just absolutely uh, a world out of balance. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, we have a long way to go, but I think that Seaspiracy as a film has, has, has contributed to that. But actually, as to what you were saying about individual effort, I think that's really what makes uh, makes things happen. Are, is the uh, passion, the imagination, the courage of individuals, people like yourself, like Dale, and so many other people, especially so many young people today, who uh, are understanding that you know they can make a difference and they shouldn't be deterred by criticism. Absolutely, 
And, and um, so a question that I have for you both uh, is, uh, because we are inside Northeastern University, a phenomenally creative uh, space uh, where minds roam free and, and uh, are encouraged to explore, um, I would like both your points of view on how technology can contribute to solve problems, how minds, young minds, and 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 uh, and people together can can create through technology changes that that help uh, curb the climate crisis and all the other problems that we face. Dale, you want to take it first? Yep, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, I think technology is fundamental. Actually, um, <clears throat> when you look at the changes we have to make in energy transport and food, how we power ourselves, how we get around, and what we eat, the technology in uh, energy generation, renewable energy, it exists uh, now. It didn't 20 years ago, I would say largely. The smart grid that we need to get to 100% powered by renewable energy is coming. The technology is more or less there. We've just got to stitch it together and practice it. The technology for electric vehicles in cars is absolutely here. 10 years from now, you won't be able to buy a conventional car. Buses are on the road. Uh, 10 years from now, there'll be electric planes in the sky. So I'd say technology is fundamental and in food. I don't think we need technology so much at all. Uh, I'm not a fan of um, cell-based cultured uh, meat that you mentioned earlier, for example, and that would be one place where technology uh, is uh, at work, but I don't think it's a good thing. And I think that that food will always be me more resource hungry than simple plants grown in the earth. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and Paul, do you, do you think there, there um ideas and, and technology that could help protect the oceans in, in your work? What, what is your dream technology that you would like to see that, that could help you achieve better results? Well, we've seen a steady evolution of that, uh, you know, from the 70s and 80s, where I had to go and find poachers pretty much by intuition. <laughs> um, <laughs> and now, uh, you know, we have uh, satellites that can see these uh, fishing vessels from the sky and uh, we're utilizing drones. Uh, to, um, you know, to get the documentation that we need. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's been a lot of advances in both communications technology and uh, navigational technology, as well as the surveillance. And so that's, uh, that's been very, very helpful. One of the, the problems with the fishing in industry is that it, it is that kind of, uh, you know, heavy industrialized technology, which has made it what it is right now, so incredibly uh, uh, pervasive in taking it, pretty much everything it wants. I mean, the fishing industry tends to give this impression to everybody that they're, you know, these are a few really courageous young, uh, courageous people who are out there catching their fish and bringing it in in small boats and selling it in markets. But what we're talking about is giant super trawlers and 100 mile long gill nets, 100 mile long long lines, uh, giant gr uh, drag trawlers that grinding up the bottom. I mean, it's just uh, incredibly destructive what we have out there. And of course, the other thing that the, that the critics are trying to say, oh, well, you know, you guys are trying to stop the poor people in Africa or India from, from being able to fish and you're taking the food out of their mouths. Well, here's the reality. Those people are being driven into poverty by industrialized corporate fishing operations. Uh, the Norwegian whale, uh, the Norwegian's uh, trawl fleet went down the coast of India and put one million fishermen out of work because they just took everything. Uh, the reason we have pirates in Somalia now in the Gulf of Guinea is because these are impoverished uh, fishermen who have nowhere to go. And so it's the industrialized fishing operations which are causing this destruction. But those corporate agents are trying to say, well, you know, we're the ones that are uh, that are impacting on those people all over the world and third world nations who need need that. But really, when it comes right down to it, there's no it's ridiculous that the Antarctic toothfish, which is caught off the coast of Antarctica, is then flown around the world to restaurants in Paris and London and New York. I mean, that is so um out of out of balance that it's it's ridiculous and this is an endangered species yeah so it's uh that has to be that has to end really we need a moratorium on all corporate commercial fishing and it, and it should be a 50 to 100 year moratorium at least i would say permanent but uh, you know i don't know if that's realistic but at least 50 to 100 years well which brings me to um where i see technology applied to food you know what we are discussing here plant-based ideas 
um, I see a lot of interesting initiatives uh, for food production that is more local and requires less land and less resources. So I've seen very interesting applications of um, vertical farming relying on uh, renewable energy completely uh, and massively reduce uh, use of water, which is also a very finite resource. In fact, probably the resource that's going to put the animal food industry uh, out of out of the game. Um, but I also see uh, some interesting things and in, in some these that do not rely on animal cells, uh, but technologies like precision fermentation and, and other technologies to produce ingredients um, so that in the future you'll be able to produce food basically where it is sold or consumed directly without having to transport it long distances and using infinite resources that are not available. So I imagine, you know, the future uh, urban context with a small, uh, you know, vertical farms and protein production plants uh, that uh, generate all the food that is consumed within the area where it is consumed. And it's gonna be fresh and healthy and organic and, and rely completely on renewable energies. That's why we need uh, young generations, the, the Northeastern University students and, and everyone of their age to concentrate on finding solutions and making these uh, technologies affordable uh, as soon as possible. And uh, some of them already are, but some still need a lot of work. Yeah, I think uh, food miles is a really interesting um, topic. And, and I think it's an area where we get distracted because the actual carbon content of food from uh, from its travel is is uh, single low digit percentages. The actual food itself is by far the bulk of the carbon content of food. So just giving up meat and dairy, for example, is hugely the biggest thing you can do. And you know, not uh, not much food at all gets air freighted. I would say. Uh, obviously, that is a crazy thing to do, and that does come with a high carbon cost. But if you look at the big picture, all food is something like one or two percent uh, is from transport. And the, the future you described there sounds beautiful, and I'm all for it. But I wonder how it can work for big cities with six or seven million people in them and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, whether that, that uh, that's actually feasible. Um, I set my team a challenge a couple of weeks ago. The devil's kitchen where we're making these burgers we were talking about earlier uh, because we've got this green gas project going on uh, where we harvest grass to make uh, gas and um, and at the same time in all of the debates i've been having recently about um ending animal agriculture one of the kind of um fallback lines of of farmers in the farming industry is that there are these areas of land where we can only grow grass and there's nothing else we can do with it which is a fallacious argument because actually we could just leave it alone and let nature have it uh, but the challenge I set the team was to see if we can't find a way to actually extract edible um, protein, human edible protein from grass uh, and, uh, and find a new food source that way. So we're looking at that now. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, th there's, um, there are incredible sources of, of uh, uh, protein and vegetables. I, I suppose you're familiar with duckweed as well and some other miracles of the kind. Uh, and I, I did hear about some grasses that have a protein content and it's interesting how you can select uh, species for, for that. Uh, but uh, Paul, I wanted to, to get back to you. Um, uh, could you please explain, uh, for those who don't know, why uh, protecting the oceans is such an important part of um, you know, thinking and, and, and achieving uh, the protection of, of, of humanity and the planet. Because a lot of people concentrate on, on land and, and lose sight of how important the oceans are in the balance. Well, like the COP21 conference in Paris, uh, I was quite concerned because there wasn't any discussion about the ocean at all. I managed to talk to Nicola Hello, who was putting on, and, and he agreed, and we had an oceans conference, although it got taken over by the um, fishing industry, uh, and uh, they started to sponsor everything. But one of the things that I said at the time is, look, you know, we really need to have this moratorium, and we have to shut down these industrialized fishing operations, because the ocean, the most important role for the ocean is as the life support system for the entire planet. And uh, phytoplankton, has been diminished in the ocean by 40% since 
since 1950, and there is that you can find the studies on that in Scientific America. 40% diminishment of the most important group of plants on the entire planet. They provide up to 70% of the oxygen in the air that we breathe. And the reality is, is that if phytoplankton disappears, we all die. We don't live on a planet without phytoplankton. It is the essential uh, group that supports us. And I always like to compare the, the Earth to uh, a spaceship, which is what it is on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way. And uh, every spaceship has that life support system, which provides the food we eat and the air we breathe and regulates climate and temperature. And uh, that uh, is run by a crew, a crew of sentient beings and plants, both and also plants that maintain everything. They maintain that life support system. But what we human beings are doing, we're we're, we're passengers, we're not crew members, but we're killing crew members, we're murdering crew members. And there's only so many crew members you can kill before the machinery begins to fall apart and uh, that whole life support system begins to collapse. So I think that's how we should really look at life in the ocean as the crew maintaining the, um, the, the machinery for the life support system. And everything is interconnected, everything is interdependent in that way. And uh, we need, for healthy phytoplankton populations, we need healthy marine mammal and seabird and fish populations. We need uh, healthy shark populations to maintain coral reef ecosystems. Everything's interdependent. And um, we really don't know what's going on there because we certainly have demonstrated that we, we don't know how to, to properly manage it. And just to clarify, would you mind explaining why phytoplankton is disappearing and what causes that disappearance? Well, one of the reasons that it's disappearing is because phytoplankton uh, requires uh, nutrients and primarily nitrogen and iron. And that's provided uh, by the feces of uh, marine mammals and seabirds and fish. <laughs> so when you diminish those species, you're diminishing the, the nutrient supply for, for phytoplankton. Uh, we call the uh, we call whales sometimes the farmers of the ocean because uh, their crop that they're, they're they're maintaining is phytoplankton. It's this thing called the whale pump. The whales go down and they feed hundreds of meters below and they bring everything up to the surface and whale species float upon the surface and provide that nutrient base. To give you an idea of how much that is, one blue whale every day defecates three tons three tons of very rich nutrient fecal material which uh, supplies the um, the nutrient base for the phytoplankton Incredible. and and uh dale um i know you 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 have been and and, and i want to touch on this point the one of the reasons why uh, dale and i admire paul watson so much is because he um puts action first uh the, the point is we all need to be activists we can't just be passive spectators of what is happening on the planet and not take a position, but especially we cannot just sit there and not, and not be active. And uh, young people especially need to, need to know that um, everything they do, and especially if they uh, take a position, an active position, and, and not only protest against what is wrong, but also take direct action to make things better, they have an enormous influence. Again, the individual that, that changes the world. But, um, but they also, I, I, I think your approach to, to this, which is not only being an activist and supporting activism, but also um, bringing very large scale change like you did with the, um, with the uh, Electric Highway UK and, and some of the other ideas. Would you mind telling us how that again through technology but but also seeing things through a different lens has has brought so much change yeah i'll give it a go <clears throat> so it began for me in 2008 and uh, i recognized that i was a, a petrol head and a tree hugger at the same time i thought it was an amusing contradiction i liked fast bikes and cars and i wanted a greener car and so i thought i needed an electric one went looking for one there was nowhere in the world that you could buy one at that time so we decided to make one and so we set out to make uh, a supercar because we uh, had long held it to be true that if you're going to make a green version of anything, it has to be at least as good as the uh, the product that you hope to replace. So in the case of a car, we had to make an amazing car, not an average or boring car. So we made a thing called the Nemesis, put it on the road in 2010. And, um, you know, it's a fantastic experience. But I learned through that that actually what was going to hold electric cars back 
was the lack of somewhere to charge them. So in around about 2010, Nissan brought the Leaf to the market, the Nissan Leaf. And I could see the big car companies were coming uh, to the party and that what was gonna hold people back was having nowhere to charge. Nobody was building electricity pumps for cars because there were no cars on the road and nobody was buying cars because there was nowhere to charge them. So we set out uh, to build this uh, national network, the electric highway. The technology at the time was simply a seven kilowatt um, socket, you know, something you'd find in your garage at home or something like that wasn't sophisticated. Within two years, we were building 50 kilowatt pumps on the motorway. And in a couple of days time, we're going to open our very first 350 kilowatt station of 12 bays on the motorway. And so in 10 years, we've gone from seven kilowatts to 350 kilowatts. And from one kind of car you could buy, the Leaf, around about 2010, to a situation where over here, you could probably choose 40 different models of electric car. The range has gone from 80 miles to about 300. Uh, the price differential is, is almost closed to, compared to a, com a combustion engine car. And the lifetime cost of ownership, of course, is far lower, not to mention the fact that they're cleaner, quieter, more fun to drive, that kind of stuff. So we're almost at a tipping point. And all of the major manufacturers have set dates now by which they will no longer make uh, fossil burning cars, which I think is fantastic. And all of that uh, will have taken place within 20 years uh, from 2010 by 2030. No more fossil cars for sale. Thanks, sir. And we're getting a few questions that I'm going to turn over to you guys. Uh, so one uh, quick one for Paul. What was it that in 1999 made you change the practices on your ships from vegetarian to vegan? Well, back in uh, 19, the late 1970s, nobody even knew what a vegan was. Uh, you know? And uh, so we thought we were being pretty progressive just by being vegetarian. And, uh, and now, of course, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty pervasive. I think it's one of the fastest growing movements uh, in the history of humanity, really. So uh, we, uh, we, we just evolved with that uh, increasing awareness and uh, went from vegetarian to being vegan. Yeah, wonderful. And, um, and uh, another question that's quite interesting is, uh, how can we make work as crew supporting the earth ecosystem valued work? To elaborate, raising children is expected to be free, caring for the environment is expected to be free, hence need for charitable donations for organizations dedicated to doing this, and spots of unpaid volunteers. Extracting and exploiting nature is paid for and profitable in the fiat monetary system. How do we fix this? Dale, do you have a suggestion? I think we actually need to fix uh, our, our economic system, actually. I think it's skewed. Uh, the wrong way it encourages to do bad things encourages uh, companies and people to do bad things like burn fossil fuels uh, farm animals intensively uh, fish the oceans intensively and you know it's through a system of subsidies that we give there's two billion pounds a year pumped in in britain alone into the industrial animal farming uh, industry uh, we still spend something like 12 billion pounds a year subsidizing fossil fuels incredibly in britain uh, we spend less on renewable energy if you want to burn coal at home, you pay, you pay 5% tax. If you want to put solar panels in, you pay 20%. Uh, so the, um, the subsidies are in the wrong place, the taxes are in the wrong place, and the regulations are in the wrong place because the regulations enable these things to happen rather than prevent them. Yeah. Well, I, I often wonder, and, and unfortunately my, my answer is pretty negative on why things are this way. Because if you think about it, uh, people are changing habits especially young people and millennials want to eat in a different way, want to have less impact on the environment, want to curb their emissions. But governments and governmental bodies are still heavily subsidizing everything that's wrong. So as you were saying, we subsidize fossil fuel, we subsidize animal-based food, which turns into huge damage for the environment, for human health, for everything. And, and it's, it's insane to think that we would uh, use taxpayers' money to create damage. Uh, unfortunately, my take on this is that corruption is, is such a force that it cannot be, I mean, it's difficult to, to, uh, to fight. Uh, there's no other reason for politicians to support this kind of subsidy is if not that they're lobbied and paid for it. So uh, I don't know how we solve that, but again, I, I, I I'm thinking relying heavily on individual choices is probably a quicker solution than hoping that politicians are not going to be corrupt. And, well, you know, uh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
the reality is that whaling, sealing, and industrial fishing could not survive without subsidies, Absolutely. enormous subsidies. Neither and, could the dairy industry. Yeah, and the, the problem is, is that politicians uh, don't have the courage or they also can't make the decisions because that tends to make them unpopular. So I think that all change has to come through the initiative and passion and courage of individuals. And all through history, that has been the case in every social re revolution. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's our mind. duty to to also to make it known to the world to you know like the conspiracy documentary is phenomenal just just show what actually happens i am um i'm all often uh in 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 discussions with people who claim that farm fish is sustainable which is ridiculous it's absolutely in, in, in another insane idea not to mention another another uh, crazy idea that doesn't make sense at all, which is insect-based protein and other stuff like that, which you can show very easily with with just a few numbers that it doesn't it doesn't compute and it doesn't make sense. Still, uh, both farm fish, uh, you know, fish farming and insect uh, farming are getting subsidies already. <laughs> we're, we're striving to get subsidies for the right technologies. Uh, there's, there's another question that came in, um, which is, are have engineered natural treat treatment systems using plants such as phragmites been implemented for water and wastewater treatment and, and have such methods been a positive contribution to balancing the climate? I have no idea how to answer this question, you, Dale, or Paul. I, I don't know the answer to the question directly, uh, but I can, I can tell you that we've got a... Um, water treatment device in R&D that we've been working on for a few years that um, combines the kind of uh, the best of, of new tech and old tech and um, it's it's been kind of it's like a miniaturized water system so at the moment we have these huge systems of pipes and pumps and treatment plants and we pump water to a house and we pump sewage to somewhere else and we've created a box that's um, it's about two cubic meters and it's been designed to be dug into a hole outside of your house um, so that it's under the ground so that you can gravity feed water to it and it's a miniature water treatment plant and it will take black water gray water rain and drain water and turn it into better than tap quality drinking water we're very excited about it because we think it um, you know can bring something to the the water element of the climate crisis that's coming absolutely and the water crisis is, is certainly the most urgent uh the United Nations and, and other bodies that have done calculations uh, uh, think that we will have uh, by 2030 at least a 40% gap between uh, supply and demand for fresh water, which is terrifying. But there's a, there's a, there's a tough question for you, Dale, here, which I, I would love to hear an answer to. Uh, as mentioned by Irina, it is said that by 2050, Solar panel, wind energy, and battery waste will be double the amount of today's plastic waste. And also for energy generation, we need iron, ore, concrete, cement, steel, glass, lithium, cobalt, copper, iridium, and, dis and dysprosium, which will eventually increase the mining process. Are solar and wind energy really sustainable? Yeah, I think they are actually. Um... And even if they're not completely sustainable of themselves, they're far more sustainable than the alternative that we have. Fossil fuel is a single use uh, energy source. You know, we dig it, mine it, pump it, refine it, using things like cobalt actually, at the, that's often uh, raised about electric vehicles and, uh, and windmills, but the biggest use of cobalt right now is in the fossil fuel industry. All of this for a single use, we burn it, pollute the atmosphere, drive the climate crisis, and then go dig some more. So I think, you know, we've got finite resources on the planet, but if we're spending them building forms of renewable energy, then we're doing the best that we can. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's interesting how, you know, it, the alternatives are often challenged, but uh, they're obviously better by the numbers. There's, there's no question in my mind. And uh, uh, Paul, back to you, the, um, I, I, I hear that uh, Seaspiracy has had a phenomenal effect on uh, the number of volunteers for Sea Shepherd. Is that, is that the case? Can you confirm? That is the case, but I, I think that the, the thing with Seaspiracy is that it was trending uh, in the top 10 and number one on Netflix. And uh, that as a media 
has certainly uh, reached a lot of people. I think really, literally millions of people that uh, we couldn't otherwise reach. Uh, we've done a lot of, been involved with a lot of documentaries over the past, but the, the thing that's more important than the documentary itself is actually the media that is, uh, that is being used to communicate that message. And in this case, it was very effective. And there's another question, um, which is how do the emissions from cargo ships and commercialized uh, fishing compound the negative effects of overfishing? What power do you envision to replace heavy marine diesel? And in fact, this is a question I wanted to ask you both. The, when, when will we see uh, electric uh, vessels uh, crossing the seas? I think we already have, uh, they're, they're under production right now, I believe. Yeah, and wind powered as well. Uh, there's a move to bring wind power back to ships and not the traditional kind of sail, but to use the wings of a modern windmill, uh, like, a, like the wing of a plane uh, mounted on the deck of the ship, uh, computer controlled to get lift and, uh, and use that for, for directional travel. Uh, those are really exciting looking concepts. So how, we also, how far in we time do we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, we also have to reduce the size of these vessels. Uh, your average cruise ship uh, goes, uh, you know, on, on uh, one ton of uh, fuel that go, only goes a couple of miles. So, uh, you know, we really have to reduce the size of these vessels. They're just monstrous. So you compare the Titanic to one of your modern day cruise ships and the Titanic looks like a miniature vessel. Oh my gosh, okay. And, and uh, uh, Dale, how far do you see uh, commercial uh, ships being based on renewable energy only? Is it 10 years away or when, when is it going to happen? I think it's going to be a, a much slower transition, potentially, than, uh, than even flying, actually. Um, it's a different kind of challenge. Uh, but, you know, the immediate thing we can do is to stop allowing them to burn the dirtiest form of fossil fuels known to man. Uh, maybe the, with the exception of coal, uh, you know, they just burn bunker fuel because it's dirt and it's dirt cheap. We can stop that, make it more expensive for them uh, in the process because they have to buy cleaner fuel, which will then um, create a different signal for the mass transport of goods around the world. You know, if it costs more to ship something, then you think twice about whether you want to ship that something and the cost of that something goes up. So Somebody on the other end thinks twice about whether they need it, whether they want to buy it. You know, if you make things ridiculously cheap, then you do ridiculous amounts of things. Again, again, you know, the role of subsidies, uh, when subsidies are used for the right reasons, then they really bring enormous change. But, you know. And um, we, we have a question that, that uh, is for both of you. I would love to hear your answer. Uh, do you have suggestions for how young people might emulate uh, this path, they're talking about the path that we, we are indicating to attaining deep and multifaceted knowledge on sustainability. There aren't many school programs that focus on this. I'd say the internet. Um, you know, I mean, it's not been around that long, actually. And I learned a lot of what I learned uh, before the internet because I wanted to, to know stuff and, and I went looking for it. But today, it's just a kind of click of a mouse away, isn't it? There's an awful lot of information out there. That would be my tip. And uh, one more question is, the Biden administration just announced a pledge to have greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Can you comment on the role food might play in that plan and or what other countries are doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through their food system? And personally, uh, since food is my, is my field, uh, I wish that the, the announcement were followed by actual uh, meaningful actions, which we usually are not. <laughs> and uh, every administration, I know every government, every governmental body immediately bends uh, to the request and, and the demands of the meat and dairy industry and, and, uh, and there it stops. So a lot of words and, and, and the Biden administration's plan uh, you know, uh, as far as I've seen, that is not very different from from the other ones. And in fact, uh, Paul, I don't know if you're if you're aware of this, but uh, I'm sure Dale is in Europe. While the European Union is is uh, waiving this you know, green deal and European Green Deal and this and that and curbing emissions, the only thing that actually done in the food space is prohibiting 
alternative dairy, so plant-based dairy from using the words milk and butter and cheese. And they even, they, they're even planning to forbid the sale of plant-based milk in cartons. I don't know what they think we're going to sell it in, you know, like the, I don't know, aluminum jars. I, I have no idea what they have in mind. But this is how they react to change. People are consuming, you know, in the U.S. now it's 20% of, of milk consumed comes from plants. And this is how they fight. Just, you know, oh, we're not going to let you sell it in a carton and call it milk. Uh, let's see how it works. Well, there's two, there's two groups of people that politicians are totally uh, afraid of. Uh, fishermen and farmers, absolutely, totally petrified by them. In fact, I coined a word called, I call it homopeshophobia, which means the politicians fear of fishermen. Generally, the farmers and fishermen get what they want because, uh, you know, they, they, they have a lot of power in that, in that respect. So somehow that has to be undermined and we have to, uh, uh, you know, have to get politicians to you know, who are more progressive than that. Uh, we're, we're seeing a bit of that in the, in the U.S., but it's going to take some time before we really, you know, ha they're going to be able to actually get anywhere with it. I mean, we have Bernie Sanders and Alexandra and other, other people who are pushing it and pushing it, but um, the powers to be are really, especially in the United States with the Republican Party, is very, very difficult to overcome. And, uh, you know, the... Uh... It, it is it is incredible how uh, politicians who are supposed to worry about uh, the common good are actually catering to uh, the richest lobbies and, and creating damage for the majority of the population. Um, there's, there's a question for you, Dale, which is, uh, what were the most important factors that influenced automotive industry to agree to convert to electric? Are these factors transposable to other damaging industries? Yeah, you know what, I think um, it may have been regulation more than anything else. I think that the, uh, the popularity of electric cars has helped massively, but I think it began with emissions uh, laws set by the EU, uh, which drove manufacturers uh, ultimately to make electric vehicles in order to comply. I believe that to be so. And, um, and to crack the technological problems, I think the, uh, the rise of the mobile phone was a big help because of the development of lithium ion batteries. Uh, but ultimately it's driven by legislation. Okay. Well, the, going back to, to uh, one of our starting points, uh, I, I think we, we should all try and give direct advice to the young people who are following this and, and, uh, and encourage them to, to act, as we said, as individuals. But um, Specifically here, this, this initiative, the plan shift initiative is to encourage ideas. It will, it will I, I believe, uh, it will, uh, funds uh, for scholarships or co-ops to come up with ideas, uh, technologies, materials that uh, remove animals from, from the equation. Uh, so um, do you have any, uh, project that you want to resolve or any needs that uh, students research and new ideas could address? Well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to lob in the grass one, you know, because the, uh, the, uh, as I say, the fallback defense of the farming industry in Britain, at least, is that there is land that we can only grow grass on and humans can't eat grass. Therefore, it's okay to grow cattle or sheep on the grass and kill them and keep them in our food system. If we could find a way to make that grass edible by humans, then uh, I think we'd take away that last leg of defense. Fantastic. And so encouragement to all students is uh, find a way and select and, 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 uh, and figure out how to grow more edible plants and more efficient edible plants. And, and as far as protecting the oceans is concerned, Paul, what is your dream technology? What do you need? What can you encourage students to work on that would really help? I should Apart point from out a what... tracking system for Japanese ships, which I know is what we really want. <laughs> uh, one thing I want to say about uh, marine uh, plants, uh, you know, uh, seaweed and things like that is that it's okay if, if we're farming it, but we should not remove uh, natural seaweeds and seagrasses from the ecosystems. 
far, far more important being the function, what it's, it's doing there in maintaining that ecosystem. So if uh, we're going to use any marine uh, vegetation, it should be uh, from farms uh, that are set up specifically for that, for that purpose. Fantastic. Well, I, I think we're close to our, uh, to wrapping up. And what I would like to ask is uh, for you both to uh, make a closing statement and, and uh, directly to the students who are watching and will be benefiting from this uh, initiative that, that Jane came up with. Do you want to go, Dale? <laughs> yeah, <I'd, laughs> it's like a Mexican standoff. That. Look, um, I believe in the power of people more than anything else. And, you know, we, we can all protest and be activists. That's one thing, absolutely. But we can be activists in our own lives as well. We can change how we live, how we power ourselves, how we travel, what we eat. They're really basic, simple things to do. But when we do that, we send powerful signals to businesses and to governments because businesses exist to make products that people buy. If we stop buying the bad stuff and we, we only buy the good stuff, they have to change the business model. We're seeing it now with some of the major food brands predicting billion turnovers in plant-based foods in the next few years. We're seeing it with electric cars. Uh, we're seeing it everywhere. And, and it's the most important thing we can do. And governments also pick up those signals as well. They're a little bit further removed from it because at the moment they are in hock to the conventional business as usual lobby. Uh, but when, when they pick it up and run with it, then the biggest of changes will come. One indication that things are changing is that Sea Shepherd for many years was considered to be quite militant in that. And now we're being invited by uh, governments around the world to come in and help protect their, uh, their territorial waters. So we now have official partnerships with uh, Colombia, Peru, Mexico, Panama, with Zambia, I mean, excuse me, with uh, the Gambia, Ghana, and uh, Tanzania, Namibia, new, numerous African countries. What we're doing is we're pro providing the resources and the volunteers, and they're providing the authority. And just this week, we arrested uh, six uh, poaching vessels in the waters of Sierra Leone, and uh, we've arrested 65 poaching vessels over the last uh, year in African waters. But more importantly, we're driving the poachers out. They're afraid to come into those waters. We're, at, we're being more successful as a, as a deterrent. So uh, the fact that uh, right now the United States uh, War College, the Naval War College, is actually using Sea Shepherd as an example of what has to be done uh, to protect the, protect the oceans. And uh, so we're, this new way we've evolved into working with these governments and that is really an indication that, you know, people are becoming more aware of the problem and the need to need to address it. Fantastic. And uh, well, as, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I just want to encourage everyone to take, uh, again, to act as individuals and not only make better choices as, as they have indicated, but also demand that better choices are available. So uh, starting from the college canteen, demand uh, choices that do not destroy the environment while they're providing you food. Demand more vegan options, they're available. They're, they're just, uh, they should be supplied to you. Uh, demand the general policy by uh, your university to use renewable energy uh, as opposed to fossil fuel whenever you can. And just start asking that, asking for that everywhere you go. Now, the more we ask uh, to have better choices available, uh, the more popular they become, and then they uh, turn the entire system upside down and, and turn it in a better direction. So I think this is what uh, what should be done. And I'd, I'd love to uh, turn the the, um, the the board back to to the Northeastern team uh, for closing comments. But I want to thank you, Dale and Paul, for inaugurating this uh, speaker series. And thank you for your incredible contributions to the right battle to curb climate change, protect the planet, protect biodiversity, protect the animals, and protect humans at the same time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dale and Paul, and definitely thank you, Sebastiano, for just this informative, empowering, and inspirational talk for Earth Day. Truly, everybody here has learned something new, has been inspired, and truly, it takes all of us to change, right? 
And so thank you all for joining us today for the launch of the Plant Shift Initiative Speaker Series. Stay tuned for registrations for future Plant Shift Initiative events. The event recording will be posted on the Northeastern University Alumni YouTube channel within the next two business days. And please be on the lookout for a post-event survey that will be sent to you via email later on this evening. Again, thank you all so much and thank you for your time.